International Airport change is also taking place. And part of the ongoing improvement project at LAX is the arrival of new upscale restaurants that showcase Los Angeles as a culinary destination. Anita Bennett takes us to the grand opening of Bee Grill by Boa Steakhouse. There's a new spot at Los Angeles International Airport to enjoy a little gourmet food on the go. What this is is basically a cafe version of Boa, where we uh, trimmed it down a little bit. It's kind of like Boa Light. That's why we called it Bee Grill by Boa Steakhouse. Boa, a popular Los Angeles chain, has locations in West Hollywood, Santa Monica, and now Terminal 7 at LAX. You have 3,500 square feet of space that is really upscale and beautiful and a allows passengers to feel like they're in a first-class area, first-class lounge without actually having to be in a lounge space. Passengers say they like what they see. The logo and everything when you walked up is really inviting and so that's kind of what drew us this way and the food was great. We had a BLT, it was amazing, and the French onion soup which was really good as well. Bee Grill by Boa is part of an ongoing effort to bring more local flavor to LAX. It really is a door opener um, so that people can see what Los Angeles has to offer and the type of, type of city that we are. So it's really representative of who we are and where we're going as a city. The menu is made up of some of the chain's most popular items. It has a lot of uh, signature dishes that we have at Boa, such as the uh, Boa Chop Chop or the Boa Burger, even has some steaks. The entrees here range from $12 to $40. And while that's not cheap for airport food, well, the customers we talk to say it was worth the price. In Terminal 7 at LAX, I'm Anita Bennett for LA This Week. Executives at the new restaurant say sales are already exceeding expectations. Local cyclists receive help from above at the annual Blessing of the Bicycles during Bike LA Week. As Gil Reyes reports, one councilman was also honored for years of service to the cycling community. <laughs> Episcopal Reverend Jerry Anderson splashes holy water on cyclists who know too well the risks on the road. Such as potholes, doors opening on them, glass in the street, and other things that it's easy for a car to pass by, but it's really, really difficult. It's challenging for bicyclists, so you have to give them a little bit more leeway. A little help from above doesn't hurt either. This multi-faith blessing of the bicycles event takes place every year at Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles. We could all use some extra protection while we're out there. This 10th annual Blessing of the Bicycles coincides with Bike Week Los Angeles, which encourages people to bike or walk to work if they can. And this year is extra special because it honors an outgoing city councilman for his years of service to the biking community. Council member Bill Rosendahl, who couldn't attend, is honored with this year's Golden Spoke Award for his work in promoting bike safety. He's championed a city ordinance that makes it illegal for drivers to harass cyclists. He's also helped lead LA's bicycle master plan through the legislative process. That plan is expected to connect 1,700 miles of bikeways when complete. There's no question that we have a long way to go, um, but what a tremendous road um, we've traveled and how far we've come. Besides uniting the cycling community, this event has also reunited council member Tom LaBonge with a long lost cousin. I haven't seen him in 40 or 50 years. Yeah. Yeah, they live way out in the valley. So that's what bikes do, it does, it brings families together. So a prayer for safety, one for the road. At Good Samaritan Hospital, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Councilmember Bill Rosendahl, who opted not to run for re-election, will be leaving office this summer as council member of the Westside District. Our city boasts many iconic buildings and landmarks whose origins you may not know. As Rasha Goel tells us, Los Angeles recently honored a man who came to this country as an immigrant, but who left a big imprint on our city. Local landmarks such as the L.A. Coliseum, L.A. City Hall, and Bullock's Wilshire represent one man's contributions to the City of Angels. And our city recently gave back by posthumously honoring renowned architect John B. Parkinson with his own day. This guy was a hero. So we salute John Parkinson today as an architect as part of Brit Week here in the City of Los Angeles. Brit Week, which highlights the connections between Great Britain and California, made for perfect timing to honor 
honor the British architect. We also are extremely conscious of the extraordinary role that Brits have made, uh, have performed in the development of the city of Los Angeles over the years. Author Stephen G., who has written a book about the British architect, was also recognized during the ceremony. No other architect more deserves this honor, and it's long, long overdue. While Parkinson hailed from England, he made a name for himself in Los Angeles in the early 20th century as the premier architect. John Parkinson's work was integral to early Los Angeles history. His majestic buildings allowed the city to develop into the commercial, social, and cultural powerhouse that it is today. We are so fortunate that these buildings survive and grace our streets still. John Parkinson passed away in 1935, but left a large imprint in the city of Los Angeles. He and his son designed over 400 buildings, such as Union Station. Over 50 of them still remain. In Los Angeles, I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. You can find out more about the life and work of John Parkinson in Stephen G's book, Iconic Vision, John Parkinson, Architect of Los Angeles. Each year, one council member honors hardworking students in his district with a special luncheon and awards presentation. Anna Marcos takes us to the Adelante Awards ceremony. Go on, slowly open, Ian. Show them that they've Magic tricks were part of the fun at the 10th Annual Adelante Awards, but there's no magic trick to how these bright students got here. Each year, the Adelante Awards honor the top two students from every school in Jose Huizar's 14th Council District. Huizar tells the audience what inspired him to launch the awards event. I remember as a young boy uh, going to school, it was those recognitions that I received that encouraged me and inspired me to continue doing well in school. Students in each school are picked by teachers and principals, not only for their academic performance, but their service to the community. It's always that pride that you have in your school and um, just being proud of myself and just keep going. We feel proud of her. I mean, this is an accomplishment that, you know, not all the people get. She's a smart little girl and hopefully, you know, she'll go to college and accomplish whatever she wants in life. There was even a scholarship for the highest GPA. Congratulations, Kai, and this is a $500 scholarship. If you're amongst the best of the best, the cream of the crop, and we hope you can continue to go on and do great things. And tonight, about 150 of these awards will sit proudly on the mantelpiece at home, encouraging the young super achievers to achieve greater things yet. That, after all, is the idea. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. A popular park and local landmark prepares to reopen. A tunnel is transformed into an underground art gallery and a reward offered in a fatal hit-and-run case. These stories and more in City Beat. It isn't quite done yet, but Echo Park Lake and the park surrounding it will reopen to the public on Saturday, June 15th. The park was closed in 2011 for a comprehensive rehabilitation funded by Prop O, the nation's largest local clean water initiative. The rehabilitation will help remedy stormwater and urban runoff pollution to meet state water quality standards. But the work won't just help the environment. City leaders say it will also allow for the lake's iconic lotus flowers to one once again, bloom. It's an unexpected art space, this underground tunnel at 3400 North Figueroa Street in Cypress Park. But Councilmember Ed Ray has worked with the owner of Antigua Coffee House to transform what was a closed pedestrian tunnel linking the coffee shop to Nightingale Middle School into a vibrant underground art gallery. Ray has secured $8,000 to have the Bureau of Street Lighting repair lighting inside the tunnel. Volunteers helped paint the inside of the tunnel. While there's no art hanging there now, the tunnel will be open to the public to coincide with the Northeast Los Angeles Art Walk held the second Saturday of each month. Councilmember Paul Krikorian has announced a $50,000 reward for information that could lead to the apprehension of suspects sought in a fatal hit-and-run incident in Valley Glen. Police say on March 24th of this year, 18-year-old David Granados was killed after a car hit him as he rode his bicycle on Bel Air Avenue at Oxnard Street. Granados died in a hospital the next day. If you have any information, you're asked to call 877-LAPD 24-7.
1,000 high school students from 24 Southern California schools participated in this year's 24th annual Los Angeles Master Chorale High School Choir Festival held at the Walt Disney Concert Hall. The event held at the end of last month was part of a year-long in-school outreach program. Festival is one of the largest high school choir gatherings in the nation. The schools from the Los Angeles Unified School District that participated were Grant, Ramon Cortinez, Venice, Narbonne, and Taft High School. The St. Andrews Recreation Center recently got a major makeover. Improvements that officials hope will benefit the whole community. Yana Kay reports. These kids are running basketball drills and getting some tips from L.A. Clippers basketball players Roni Turiaf, Eric Bledsoe, and Willie Green. It's all part of a special event to celebrate several upgrades to the St. Andrews Recreation Center in South Los Angeles. I think it's great. I, um, we come here a lot, and it was a little messy when there was sand everywhere, so now that they have renovated it and given it that soft ground, it's, it's great. I can see them jumping and they're not falling and hurting themselves, which I've seen before. The Clippers organization, as part of its FIT program, which promotes health and wellness, along with the Department of Recreation and Parks, the California Endowment, the City of Los Angeles, and other private corporations partnered to refurbish three Los Angeles parks. We came out here and we built this park for you. This is about you. We want you to come out here. We want you to have fun. We want you to stay healthy, and we want you to take care of this park. Some of the upgrades include new basketball courts, a new fitness zone, and a refurbished playground with a rubber surface. And these kids couldn't wait to try it out. All in an effort to encourage fitness, good nutrition, and a healthy and active lifestyle. What we want to do is provide a uh, place for our kids in the community of Los Angeles to have a safe and uh, safe place to come and play. Every parent here, every child here knows that you need physical activity, physical activity to be healthy, physical activity to have a happy life. <laughs> A ribbon cutting made it official, marking the transformation of an old park into a bright gathering and activity spot for all to enjoy. I'm Yana Kay for LA This Week. And in this week's list of things to do, a classic film about a newspaper tycoon, a documentary that's all about Venice, and catching a stage performance while waiting for the metro train. It's a classic movie every movie buff should see and see again. The 1941 Warner Brothers film Citizen Kane will be playing Saturday, May 25th at 7.30 p.m. at the Egyptian Theater, located at 6712 Hollywood Boulevard. Orson Welles was only 25 when he directed this masterpiece and remains one of the most phenomenal motion pictures ever made. Wells also stars as Charles Foster Kane, a ruthless man who built a newspaper publishing empire who was supposedly modeled after the real-life William Randolph Hearst. For ticket information, go to AmericanCinemaTech.com. And for a totally different kind of film experience, head on over to Beyond Baroque in Venice on Saturday, May 25th from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. to catch the high-def documentary Venice Souvenir about the people, places, and things in Venice, Los Angeles. Watch over 40 different stories about shopping on Abbott Kinney Boulevard, boardwalk performers, surfing and roller skating in the Venice Beach area, and more. Beyond Baroque Literary Art Center is located at 6 681 Venice Boulevard. Go to beyondbaroque.org for ticket information. And here's a unique way to enjoy the theater. The Meet Me at Metro 4 program is bringing stage performances to you at the Metro stations. On Saturday and Sunday, May 25th and 26th, the Watts Village Theater Company will be staging shows at noon and again at 1 p.m. near the 103rd and Rosa Park stations along the Blue Line in Watts. Each performance piece, which explores the subjective theme of home with musical accompaniment, will run about half an hour. The 103rd Metro Station is located at 10100 Grandy Avenue, and the Rosa Park Station is located at 11611 Willowbrook Avenue in Watts. Go to Meet Me at Metro 4 at Eventbrite.com for ticket and other information. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do.
She's a funny lady who's getting the last laugh. Known best for her namesake show, The Carol Burnett Show, the comedian is now being honored by the city of Los Angeles with her own namesake square. She's seen her name in lights and even her likeness painted on this mural on the east wall of her alma mater, Hollywood High School. And now right outside the school at Highland and Selma Avenues, the award-winning actress, comedian, and best-selling author, Carol Burnett, has an intersection named in her honor. I went to Hollywood High School on Highland here, and I went to Selma Avenue Grammar School. And so that's, that's a thrill. This was my neighborhood. I grew up here. These I went to all the movies here with my grandmother on Hollywood Boulevard, and uh, I just hope she's up there somewhere looking down and being as proud as I am today. Burnett celebrated the unveiling of Carol Burnett Square with her signature ear tug, and by doing what she's done for decades, posing for the cameras. And judging from the shouts from the media, Burnett, at the age of 80, still hasn't lost her appeal. Someone so special, who's so international, who everyone loves, is a graduate of Hollywood High, who everyone admires, who took generations of people to points of family entertainment that was never seen before. Indeed, Burnett made millions laugh with The Carol Burnett Show, which aired from 1967 to 1978. But on this day, the funny lady was reduced to tears of joy when students from Hollywood High School paid tribute to her and her career with a moving song. Keep the dream. Burnett never did give up and succeeded in show business beyond her wildest imagination. But Carol Burnett has always been more than just a funny lady. She's also an inspiration for the next generation of entertainers. Most recently, Burnett, who turned 80 on April 26th, became a best-selling author with a memoir about her late daughter, Carrie Hamilton. That's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of L.A. This Week. Visions that can change the world Trapped inside an ordinary girl She looks just like me Too afraid to dream out loud And though it's said for your idea It won't make sense to everybody You need courage now If you're gonna persevere G'day, Troy McCubbin from North Hollywood. You're watching LA City View, Channel 35, our city, our channel.
I want to welcome everybody to the Los Angeles City Council Chambers. Today is Tuesday, May 21st, uh, Election Day. I hope, uh, I want to thank those who voted by mail or have already voted uh, this morning and remind those that have not voted of the importance of exercising your right and that the polls will be open until 8 p.m. this evening uh, during the primary I think we had a 21 22 percent turnout and that uh, was an embarrassment for me it should be an embarrassment for us so let's uh, bump that number up everybody that can physically vote please go vote madam Qu uh, clerk I believe we have a quorum Please call the roll. Kambuska, you know, Englander, Garcetti, Wizar, Chris, Kricoyne, LaBange, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rolls, Nall, Zion, West, and Tim, 11 members, President, a quorum, Mr. President. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Uh, Koretz moves, Wizar seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Okay, Zion moves, Buscaino seconds. Mr. President, today is Tuesday, and now would be the time for the flag salute. Okay, if I could ask everyone to please rise for the salute of our flag that today will be led by Mr. Dennis Zine. Thank you. Place your hand over your heart. Ready to begin? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please have a seat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dennis Zine. This council usually meets on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m., except for this week we will have an additional meeting this Thursday uh, because of an error on my part. Instead of meeting at 9 on Thursday, we will be meeting at 10 a.m. this Thursday to uh, go over our budget. Our budget chair is ready, and I hope that uh, we see everybody at 10 a.m. so that we can get started. Well, let's go through the uh, agenda first, and then we'll go to the uh, presentations. Madam Clerk, the ball is in your co court. Items one and two are items notes for public hearing. There's a request that I, uh, to receive and file item one. Without objection. And also the Department of Building and Safety reports that item 2A may be received and filed in as much as the ownership has changed. Without objection. Also the department requests to continue item 2B to June 18th. Without objection. Are there any cards? Cards on item 1. Okay, then let's hold uh, that item. And let's take up the remaining items on in item two, or there are none? No, um, there's uh, nothing to vote on in that section. Okay, Mr. Zine. Um, five special, please. Okay, we'll get there. I thought uh, we're up to 15. Well, three, yeah, as soon as, soon as we get there. Okay. So right now, Madam Clerk, where are we? Four, four items special. three through 15 are items which public hearings have been held. Okay, Ms. Perry? I just wanted to call four special for Mr. Parks. Yeah. On, and what item again? Number four. Item four, Mr. Zine wanted five. I believe, Mr. Labange. Item 15, please. Item 15 for Mr. Labange, Mr. Labange, and let's, uh, Mr. Koretz. I'd like to call uh, item eight special for the purposes of recusing myself at that time. Item eight for Mr. Koretz. No more. Let's prepare to vote, Madam Clerk. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven eyes. Okay, this, that brings us to our next section, Madam Clerk. Yes, Mr. President, and um, for number three, the ordinance, that ordinance will be held over for one week unless reconsidered with 12 members. Okay. Items 16 through 22 are items which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes required for consideration. Okay, without objection, those uh, items are now before us. Do I have cards? Cards on items 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Okay, let's vote on uh, members. Any specials there? Mr. Reyes? Continue 19. Continue item 19 so at the request of Mr. Reyes. Till what date, Mr. Reyes? Uh, Tuesday. To a week from today. May 28th. Okay, so let's uh, 
Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Okay. Are we finished with our agenda? Yes, Mr. President. That takes counsel to presentations or items called special. Okay. At this time, I'd like to call Ms. Perry uh, to the podium for a presentation. Ms. Jan Perry, the floor is yours. Come here. Take that sticker off. Yeah. It's weird, huh? You guys will come up? Okay. This is the uh, family from a place called home. And we have a big family in the 9th District on Central Avenue. <laughs> I am very, very proud to present the family members of a place called home on Central Avenue in South Los Angeles to the City Council to highlight their work as they celebrate their 20th anniversary serving the needs of young people all over South Los Angeles. Now a place called home was founded by this lady here. Her name is Deborah Constance. Now, the first time I ever heard about her was from another woman who was an activist, and her name was Juanita Tate. And she said there was some woman who got a house over by, it was Jefferson, right? Jefferson High School, and was reaching out to kids in the community and helping them with after school activities. And that's how it started. And following the 1992 riots, the mission was to give kids who were hurt badly by lack of resources and gang activities in their community, a safe place to go after school, to do their homework, get a snack, just hang out, get mentoring, get guidance, and to be with people who cared about them. A Place Called Home has many, many mentoring projects, alternative schooling, literacy, tutoring programs, health services, counseling, sports and recreation programs, and they have helped well over 4,000 young people since its founding. A place called home provides a home away from home for more than 300 young people each and every day and serves more than 1,000 young people and their families every year and thousands more community members via large-scale events such as health fairs, concerts, screenings, and regular distributions of food, clothing, toys, books, schools, school supplies, and more. A place called home has been nationally recognized for their innovative programs and for helping young people find a secure and positive family environment in which to learn and gather the skills necessary to prepare for a productive life. So in just over, in just, I'm sorry, with the vision of Deborah, and 12 children in the basement of a church. A place called home has grown into 25,000 square feet with a facility that has an athletic field, a commercial kitchen, a garden, a dance program, a music program, art studios, a library, a computer lab, and a recovery center for people who have dropped out of school, and a teen center. And so Deborah, thank you for having the vision. Jonathan, thank you for moving that vision forward. And this is Jonathan. He is the executive director, and he's going to speak in a few minutes. And I'd also like to thank Baron Nisi Bautista. Berenice. Yeah. Berenice, Berenice, <laughs> to say a few words about what a place called home has meant to her, and then we'll let the adults talk. <laughs> okay. Um, um, no, talk about your too. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bernice Bautista. I walked into a place called home about 11 years ago. And while a lot of things have changed and the program has become even better, one of the things remains the same, and it's Deborah's mission, heart. It is the ability to walk in there and know that every staff there believes in you, that they will see you through your childhood, 
your teenage years, the rebellion ones, and then we'll see you into college. Yes. We're all laughing. I am part of the Shaheen Scholarship now. I walked in there as an 11-year-old, and it is because of them that I am transferring from Santa Monica this year. I don't know if I'm going to go to Riverside or Davis yet, but I know that whatever I choose, they'll be there for me. And I think it is because of these programs that so many of our youth are not in the street, that so many of our youth are giving the opportunity to see what's out there. Um, and from the bottom of my heart, I want to come back here in 20 years and see it recognized for its 40th anniversary and see how much it's gonna grow and see it expand into other neighborhoods because it does so much for the kids and the families as well. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I'll let me say if okay. there's any, or do you wanna introduce her? Okay, all right. Then. Or you want to? No, no, I just, um, before Jonathan speaks and introduces the queen of the world, uh, I uh, wanted to just uh, show you, she's multi-talented and she makes these dolls, uh, folk art, and uh, an expression of who she is as a wonderful person. And now let me introduce Jonathan Zeichner, who is Ze Zeichner. Zeichner, you Zeichner. got it right. You got uh, executive director <laughs> from a place called home who is going to introduce our founding mother. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Uh, thank you. Hi, Bill. Good to see you. Uh, Mr. President and esteemed council members, it's great to be here to celebrate the 20th anniversary of this remarkable organization. I've had the honor of helming it for uh, the past three and a half years. Uh, but I'm going to tell you in just a moment about the person who founded this, this uh, amazing uh, service-oriented organization to a place um, for the city of Los Angeles. But first, I have to acknowledge all the folks who are standing behind me including the chairman of our board, Cyrus Hadidi, uh, and staff who are here from a place called home, and many original board members who were around uh, two decades ago when the organization started and have sustained the organization all of these years. Uh, Sister Pat Connor, who started as a volunteer and then got involved and stayed for so many years at a place called home. Uh, it's a remarkable community that exists in that center at the corner of Central and 29th, and we provide a lot of services uh, and love doing it. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to talk too much more because I want to introduce you to somebody who's a personal hero of mine and who has made a difference in the lives of 15 to 18,000 young people and their families in South Los Angeles over the past 20 years. This is a woman who took her own uh, scars and pain uh, and turned them into love and service and has just not stopped. I, I love you, Deborah. I'm proud to have come after you, and I want to give you the mic and, and let you tell a little bit of your story. Ladies and gentlemen, Deborah Constance. Well, I'm not going to tell you a bit about my story, but I would like to say is Jan Perry has been an influential part of my life for over 20 years. Over 20 years ago, I met Jan when she was Rita Walter's assistant, and she's running after her, and she was, right away, she was incredible. And it was Jan Perry that I called when I had moved into a 10,000 square foot facility, and I had all these children in there, and I realized I didn't have a child permit. I had an adult permit to run this whole place. I said, Jan, I think you gotta come over here. They're gonna close us down, and she did. And every time I would call Jan, she was there. For 20 years, Jan has been by my side. And so she has been a remarkable, remarkable woman. And I wanna thank Jonathan. Jonathan, I have a vision, but he keeps that vision. I, my vision was love, purely love. I started playing school with love, and that's all it was. Bill Rosendahl knows that. He sat in my office, and he interviewed me. You can see, you can see it on TV. <laughs> and he kept saying, well, they should have one in every corner. Why, why isn't there a place called home? The temple should open a place called home. At school should. Why are the children out on the street? And that's what Bill said. And, and that was an important, important statement to me because that's all I ever want to do is help other people follow their dream. And Jonathan, Jonathan has been unbelievable. He has, he has taken a place called home and blossomed my vision, blossomed my love. And when you walk into a place called home, you can still feel it in your heart. So that is unbelievable. And in the back row, we have Rob Davidow, Colin Harwich, Bruce Newberg, 
that have been with me for 20 years. Doug has been with me part of those 20 years, but they have been with me for 20 years. And when you have a board member like that, when you have a board that sticks you together, whether you're failing or being good, whether you're down to $1 or $100,000, and they're there and they see what's wrong with your budget and see what's wrong with what you're doing with accounting, and they see and they straighten it out. And so I am so lucky. I am so lucky. A place called home was a home. It wasn't work. It was a home that I created for myself. It was a safe place for me to go. And that's what it still is today. So thank you, Jan. Thank you. you deserve it. Thank you. Let's take congratulations to Councilmember Perry, to this great organization, and for all those lives that you have transformed. Thank you so much. On behalf of the City of Los Angeles, congratulations, Thank Councilman. Thank you President. all for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Rose Rosendahl. Yes, I, I wanted to do a shout out, and <clears throat> the shout out came toward me, which was also well thought of and appreciated by me. But Deborah, when you, when I went to that place called home, you're right. We should have one on every corner, everywhere, and take care of our kids. And when Jonathan came along, who's got that extra energy of a bounce. Uh, I knew that we had the right person in it. But most importantly, Jan Perry, you've shown more leadership on dealing with homeless issues, with children with disabilities, with all of that in your service to the people. So I want to thank you and everybody else with you for what you're doing. You. Mr. President. Mr. LeBron. Can I second the motion? that Mr. Rosendahl said about Jan Perry. Jan, right. you really have. You really have done it all. I was through the neighborhoods in downtown yesterday, and I just remarked what a wonderful job you've always done. Jan Perry, place called home. She's always got a place called home because she's a wonderful person. Thank you. Okay, now we'll take up item, item one that's been called special by Mr. John Walsh. Mr. Walsh, would you please come forward? Daniel, come to the ropes and let me know what, what issue you're here on. John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the city council members. Oh, Garcetti's not here. He's running for mayor. Okay, in it for himself, HollywoodHighlands.org. And uh, this is a hearing protest about a BID, which in uh, Jefferson Park is merchant-based. In Hollywood, I pay for it because the land, it's landlord and merchant-based. They're asking to uh, disestablish the BID. Well, that's a good idea. So the city would have to pay, uh, instead of your paying for it, the city will pay for it. Now, in Hollywood, we have a, a police force, a, a secondary police force, which does a good job. We get that out of the BID. I don't know if they're getting that out of uh, uh, Jefferson Park. But I got to run now pretty soon because I got to vote. I'm going to vote three Come times. Come on, on the subject. Three times. And I want to thank Ms. Design, uh, and you're our next uh, controller. Thank you. HollywoodHighlands.org. Okay. All right. Uh, let's uh, prepare to vote. Let's Excuse me, Mr. President, for this item, there was a request to be received and filed this item. Okay, then, without objection. All right. Uh, next item will be... We have to vote for reconsideration on... I believe it's uh, item three. So uh, the first vote will be on reconsideration. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Okay, now we'll vote on the item again because we have 12 members. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Item 16, John Walsh.
minute two. John Walsh, I'd like to say hello to the entire council, the exception of Mr. Garcetti. Stay on here. the subject. Well, this is the greeting. Can't even greet people? Oh, I don't know. It's uh, number 16. This is Raul Perez, City Ethics appointment. Uh, oh, it's, to, it's to the Board of Airport Commissioners. As you know, today the Board of Air, Airport Commissioners, Mr. Perez, I don't know if he's on there already, or, but uh, they are going to be naming a huge building out by the airport, the Antonio Viragosa Lou Parker building, Lou, Lou Leonard building. In other words, the, the main building will be named after the mayor and each room will be named at the new airport building after someone he screwed. HollywoodHighlands.org. Come, Come on, Mr. Walsh. Let's uh, prepare to vote on that item. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Okay, now. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I had an eight that I just mentioned. Okay, now what we're going to do is, uh, Mr. Koretz, we're going to take up item eight. So. Yes. Um, in order to avoid any question or appearance of conflict, because my wife is employed by Kaiser, though she is not involved with this program, I need to recuse myself on this item. Go right ahead, sir. We will wait for Mr. Koretz to exit the chambers. Mr. Labanche. And this is a great program as Mr. Koretz leaves the building. They help us at our swimming pools. Kaiser is a great contributor to our program for young people uh, of all ages to swim in our public pools. And they certainly are, but I sure wish they'd give us a break on our premiums that we pay them. But with that said, <coughs> Let's prepare to vote on that item. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Okay, we'll go to uh, item 17. Mr. Walsh, item 17. John Walsh, blogging at jwalshconfidential.wordpress.com, or just go to hollywoodhighlands.org. There's several new posts up today. This is number 17, DWP. I am tired of the demonization of the DWP. Southern California Edison just got fined $60 million for a forest fire they started. PG&E up in Northern California killed eight people. Old white guys, I hate the WDWP, I hate them. You know why they hate them? Because they don't have any sex. That's why they, and that's why I'm voting for Eric Garcini. Uh, he's going to get the DWP. Stay on the he subject, made. Mr. Walsh. The subject is the Stay DWP. on the subject. First, get a Department of Transportation, and we are 100% in favor of the DWP. You do a great, great job, HollywoodHighlands.org. Okay, let's prepare to uh, stay close, Mr. Walsh. We're going to do item 18 next. Okay, um, let's prepare to vote. Let's uh, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Okay, we'll do item 18, held special by Mr. Walsh. He passes. So let's prepare to vote on this item. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 eyes. And now, Mr. Walsh, we're doing 20, which you called special. Item 20. Did I sign all of the other ones? John Walsh, blogging at HollywoodHighlands.org. The endorsements are up there before you go to vote. This is number 20. Uh, this is resurfacing the streets. 
When, uh, when our current mayor came in, we had good streets. Eight years later, we have the worst paved streets on the planet Earth. Oh, excuse me, I believe, uh, I, I believe New Delhi. We're tied with New Delhi in India as the Mr. worst Mr. President, he is not talking world. about this, this particular matter. This is the construction matter. of a gas line connection under the streets of L.A., a one-year moratorium on cutting into newly resurfaced streets. In other words, they're resurfacing the streets, doing it the wrong way, and now they have to cut into the streets for the gas line. So now they have to pass something to say we're not going to, uh, we're going to leave the gas lines the way they are for the next year, and that's dangerous because these are new resurfaced streets. The right hand does not know what the left hand is doing in Hollywood and, and in L.A. and in, the, in this entire county. And that's why stay tuned, because during the two minutes that I can talk on anything, I will be proposing marriage to Eric Garcetti. Okay, let's uh, open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Okay, Ms. Perry, are you ready for number four, item four, which you held? Are you ready for item four? Oh, and I lost. Mr. Parks, are yes. you ready for item four? Yes, I am. Thank okay, you. now we're on item four. Could I have the, the, the uh, ethics staff come up with just some questions to ask? Please come forward. Good to see you, Heather and crew. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I just was trying to figure out in reading the report how this new ordinance is going to uh, deal with operationally. I understand the concept, but one of the things in looking at it is that we have a progressive depending on how many times someone gets caught, the progressive penalty. Does it ever, that penalty ever reach to permanent? It, Heather Holt for the Ethics Commission. Good morning. No, it does not. The most uh, amount of time that a person would ever be debarred is four years. Is that because of the charter or is that because of yes. policy? Yes, yes, that's in the Sorry. charter. Okay, the other thing I was wondering is that and when we get to sections, uh, page three, sections B and C, there are these 21-day requirements that you have to notify and then notify, I guess, the vendor. Uh, one of the things, how long do you think this process will take? Because my major concern would be how long do we hold up the process? Yes, that's an excellent question, and because of the confidentiality uh, requirements that we have with regard to our enforcement matters, we would not be able to publicly announce that there was an issue with regard to debarment um, until about a week before an ethics commission meeting was held. That's when our binders go out, our agendas are made public, um, and at that point there would be notice that would be given to the affected departments, and um, unless the ethics commission decided to continue the, the decision, it would be done within about a week. Okay. What I was wondering, when you say in there that they should stop everything once you make the notification, was there any consideration of allowing them to continue the process but not make a decision? Uh, there was, uh, but because of concerns about the respondent um, not being considered in the same vein as everyone else, um, there, the decision was that holding it for a week for every every purpose was probably the better protection for the respondent. See, what my concern is, is it's like one of those questions they ask in court, they ask it and then they withdraw it, it's already out there. So if you put that out there and say hold it because there's an investigation, it seems to be unfair that once the process continues that you're going to erase that from the people's minds that are making the decision. It would appear to me that if you didn't advise them at all, let them go through the process but not make a decision, that they wouldn't know who you were talking about and they wouldn't alter their perception of the company. Because every one of these processes have a second and a third and a fourth person that's in the queue, but it just seems that you're tainting 
a potential bidder, and then you come back and say, oh, they're okay, now go back with the process, that will never be erased from the reviewer's mind. Um, that may be true, uh, but unfortunately in, in that regard, um, fortunately in many other regards, uh, the decisions that the Ethics Commission makes regarding enforcement matters are public anyway. So even if no special notice were given to the departments that might be affected, um, then the information would be out there just because it's a public process. But, but I'm saying is you stop them early on from even making the consideration, I'm just trying to figure out what's the benefit of that when you could allow them to con continue the process and then notify them not to make a decision without, then when it becomes public, it's clear to them basically who you're talking about, except hopefully they've completed the process and they can't go back and alter the process. That's right, and I may not have been clear okay. in, in explaining this before, but the, we, that would be the process if an investigation were going on and negotiations were being conducted with the respondent, the departments would not be notified at that point. It would only be that they would be notified when our um, agenda materials became public, which would be about a week before a commission okay. meeting. But so, but that's not coordinated with where they are in the process. No, it would be it would be done independently of where the departments are in the um, bit in the contract process. Then my final question is that it seems like on one of your subsections eight that you have a different process for those who are already under contract. That you allow them to continue to be paid, continue to operate while the investigation is going on. I'm sorry, on subsection H. I think it's H. Yes, and that's, uh, there's a, an additional provision in the charter that says that if the Ethics Commission determines that debarment is appropriate for a particular respondent, then a department who has an existing contract with that contractor can make its own determination about whether that contract should be terminated, if that's in the best interest of the city. So this, that section um, has less to do with the Ethics Commission's process and more to do with the department's decision about whether to continue a, a particular contract with a respondent who is going to be debarred. But if they make that decision in the best interest, they won't have the benefit of your investigation. They'd have to do that independently. Uh, they would do that independently, but they would have the benefit of the decision that our ethics commissioners made because that would be done prior to any decision that they might make to terminate a contract. Okay, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Okay, there are no more speakers on the queue. Let's prepare to vote on that item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Uh, Mr. Rosendahl, item five, I believe. Billy, are you ready? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Appreciate it. Item number five, folks, has to do with the LAX expansion versus modernization. You all know how I feel. Regionalism is the solution. And if we show some patience in a couple of years, it will actually be such that the airlines will do nonstop direct frequent and discounted flights out of Ontario. And that's my dream, and I know this dream will happen in my lifetime because I'm hoping to live another 20, 30 years. But I'd like the airport people to come up real quick. Got one big question for you. Why, why, when you got the official letters, and he's, here are the official letters, that came from both SEIU and RSAC and saying, let's sit down and have mediation. Let's have a discussion. The five days have gone by. Uh, Lawa, from what I gather, has not responded to them. And if you want to get on the road for litigation again, shut down modernization, this is how you get into that mindset. So the big question is, this request was submitted by RSEC and SEIU United Surface Workers. Why have you not responded to their official letters saying, let's sit down and have mediation, or we will sue, which is obviously implied when you get lawyer letters like this. Please. Um, uh, this is Suzanne Tracy with the yeah, City right. Attorney's Office for LAWA. Um, I can answer requests with respect to the specific code provision that sure. they sent the letters on. That code provision is the Public Resources Code 21167.10. Right. It's an opportunity for someone to send a request for mediation to the lead agency, which would be uh, the BOAC or LAWA in this case. Uh -huh. Those requests are deemed denied if they are not responded to within five business days. That's correct. All of the requests that have been sent 
the ones that you've mentioned. Yes. The time period uh, to respond to those uh, has has gone by. Yes, Therefore, but they why? have been denied. Why did the airport not respond? To avoid the potential conflict of litigation, which I'm against. I don't want to shut down modernization. I certainly want to shut down expansion for the obvious reasons I've given about regionalism in Southern California. So maybe maybe the operational guy can help us. Can you explain why? The lawyer said the lawyer answer, which is appropriate, but why didn't Lawa BOAC respond? But if I could, I'm sorry to interrupt one more sure. time because my lawyer answer has a little more. I'm not speaking as to I policy. Understand. No, fair but there, there is a threat of litigation uh, sure. and the BOAC has held closed session with respect to the litigation and has reported out with no action. And so that's the totality of what I'm, I'm able to address. Yeah, well, colleagues, I don't know if you want to go into closed session and take up more time and energy or not. See, people's heads are looking down, so I don't see the energy there. But I, I'm very clear about this. I just want to make sure we understand this. I don't want lawsuits. I don't want to shut down modernization. I want to continue to modernize, to pass the cost on to the airlines. And in a couple of years, because right now they're equal, it's like 12 bucks for both, we've done some major modernization, the Bradley Terminal, and working on the people mover and the consolidated rentals coming and the midfield terminal is happening, all that good stuff. And I'm really excited, and thanks Bernard Parks for this, that we're gonna be able to talk about both the Crenshaw Line in Lamar Park and the Crenshaw Line stopping in Westchester. That's all part of what I call regionalism. I call public transportation. You know, I call all of these things into one breath. And, and I'm patient enough to tell you that regionalism is the solution for us. We're not Seattle, we're not New York, and all that other stuff. So for my colleagues' understanding, if you're gonna vote yes again for expansion of LAX, um, there will be a lawsuit and we'll be back to square one. I'll be on the outside and I'll be feeling sad because I believe in regionalism is the real solution for us. So I would like colleagues for you not to vote uh, unless you want to give me something else to say why these potential lawsuits aren't going to happen. There, you had five days to respond. You didn't respond. It's on a collision course. I don't like collisions. I'm a positive spirit. That's why I'm standing up, even though I'm in this health situation that most people wouldn't be coming around here. But I come around here because I love what I'm doing and I believe in the cause. Is there anything you can say? I mean, this item was appropriately agendized for closed session with our board, and so uh, they have not reported out any action, so I cannot speak for the board on that issue. I see. Okay, colleagues, so um, at the very least, I'd like you to continue the item, but do whatever you want. I, I want you to either vote no or continue the item. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, thank you, Bill. And it was heard in closed session by your commission. I don't think uh, it would be appropriate at this time for us to defer it and try to place it in closed, closed session. But I will chat with the city attorney to verify that I'm accurate on that. Mr. Zine? Well, I support to my colleague, Mr. Rosenall, on this and uh, the folks adjacent to the airport uh, at Westchester and some of the other communities uh, I was out there uh, yesterday and talked to some of the business owners. While they're talking about the runway situation, it extends beyond that. They're talking about demolishing buildings that are uh, in the, the path, which is uh, going to relocate or destroy businesses. Uh, has that been discussed at all with the commission, some of the other aspects, the residual aspect, aspects of this? I'm, I'm sorry, um, when you say discuss with the commission, you mean outside of closed session in a public session item? Or, or a closed session or with, within the commission to say that it's not only the airport property itself, but it's adjacent property and commercial businesses that are going to be impacted, which some of those businesses are going to be uh, shut down, demolished, and the buildings are going to be removed. Right. The remove. Diego Alvarez, the program manager for the specific plan amendment study. Uh, there is not a proposal, it is not part of the project to, to remove any uh, structures um, associated with, with the runway reallocation or, or a realignment. Well, the information in the community from the business owners is that there will be businesses that need to be demolished because of the 
direct, not directly on the runway, but yeah. the buffer zone. Yeah. That's what they we, refer we, to as the buffer been, zone. We've been very clear. There are businesses and homes in the runway protection zone, which is the area that they're probably speaking about today. There are, in fact, 31 parcels not owned by the airport uh, that are in that zone today. Um, if we were to follow through with the 260 North alternative, you would actually rem remove all the homes out of the buffer area. You wouldn't take them out, but the, the buffer area would move west away from the homes, and there would be a reduction in the total number of parcels in the runway protection zone from 31 to 30. So that's, we have disclosed that as part of the EIR process, but it is not a proposal of the airport to remove any homes or businesses um, associated with the movement of the runway. What about businesses along Sepulveda Boulevard? Those are specifically the ones I'm talking about. Okay, well, they are under the impression that some of those businesses, because of the buffer zone, are going to be impacted. That's not part of the proposal. Okay, thank you. Mr. Labange. As a chairman of the committee, I asked for an aye vote. This has been thoroughly discussed. I don't want to disappoint anybody, Mr. Rosendahl. Safety, all the aspects of it, it's a positive approach to help in the region that we live in. Call for an aye vote. Thank you. Let's uh, prepare to vote on this. Let's open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten ayes, three noes. Without objection. Okay, uh, Mr. Labange, while you're up, are you ready on item 15? Yes, just uh, I want to I vote. This is uh, need to be called by the clerk or 50s before us. You, what, I didn't hear him, Madam Clerk. Fifteen. On item five, the public hearing was already held, so we have already satisfied that uh, state requirement. Patrice, am I okay? Okay, Mr. Bonge. Yep. Thank you. This is just a point that I want our council to make, that if the MTA does have uh, rail into the San Fernando Valley, that it would come over the 405, in behind Station 88, up Sepulveda, and then connect due north of Oxnard. Uh, this is just a position that Mr. Koretz and I, as the councilman, uh, council members of that area feel it more appropriate as opposed to rail down Van Nuys Boulevard south of the Orange Line because its impact on the existing businesses and uh, park system that is there. Thank you. I ask for an I vote. Mr. Koretz, you just made it. Yeah, I, I just want to speak up in support of this motion because the Sepulveda option could make for a better potential, potential connection and a future connection through the Sepulveda Pass, and I think it should be a, a priority for us. So I ask for your I vote as well. Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, on the other side there of Sepulveda, that is a big issue in our district, and this is moving us in the right direction and being creative with new ideas as well. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Rosendahl. Okay, let's uh, vote on this item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Okay, that should bring us, uh, Madam Clerk, to general public com uh, comment, am I correct? Yes, Mr. President. Okay, so I want to call Daniel Gus, John Walsh, and I believe this is Delisa Carr or Ka. Mr. Gus. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm proudly wearing my Zion for Controller t-shirt. More about a great city official in a minute. But I want to thank and congratulate Jim Bickhart for getting off of two and a half years of job probation for things that he posted about what our residents should do to homeless people in Venice. Like take them in a truck, dumping them out in the, out in the desert like the quote-unquote scum that they are. That's Mr. Bickhart of the mayor's office. Imagine what you do in this city to get on two and a half years of job probation, but not lose your job. That's what's wrong with the city. Congratulations for Jim Bickhart for having some kind of dirt on the mayor. I don't know how the hell he kept his job all of this time. And God help the people of CD13. Neither of your candidates live in the district. I don't know how in the heck you're gonna get by the next four or eight years. But I wanna get to Dennis Zine soon city controller, 
Mr. Zein gets stuff done. When we had a problem with Ed Bokes, Dennis Zein gathered the information, worked with his council colleagues, and got rid of Ed Bokes. And I like Mr. Koretz, he's a good animal person, Mr. Alicorn, Mr. Cardenas when he was here, Mr. Rosendahl. But when I had a problem with animal services, Dennis Zein and his team, those are the people I go to. Also Mr. Wesson, who does adoptions here, of course. Uh, when we had a cheating commissioner who makes more than a million dollars a year named Ruth Ann Secunda, who felt that she could vote on us to pay animal license fees, but didn't want to pay them herself, I went to Dennis Zine. Dennis Zine's people worked with the council colleagues and got rid of a millionaire who was cheating the city while sitting on a commission. I genuinely believe that Dennis Zine will be a take-no-prisoners controller. He is a good guy. He's been a lifelong city servant, 30, uh, 30 plus years on the LAPD, 12 successful years on city council. I'm voting and celebrating Dennis Zine for controller. We'll see you tonight. Okay. Um, John Walsh. Followed by Ms. Carr. John Walsh, blogging on HollywoodHighlands.org. I disagree with the gentleman about uh, Zion. I like him even more than he does. It's just time to show the LA Times, which is saying that Zion isn't going to win, that Zion is going to win by 10 or 12 points. We want Zion. Vote now. I'm telling you out there. Garcetti must lose. He's so confident. He has rented the Palladium for thousands and thousands to show up, eight or nine thousand people. And where is he now? Did he show up here? No. Mr. Engler is sitting there all alone. I feel sorry for him. That is the contempt that he has for his job. And he will show the same content. Anybody but Garcetti for mayor. Mail-in ballots. If you have a mail-in ballot, take it to the nearest precinct now. Look, vote early, vote often. I'm going to vote at least three times. The least you can do is vote once and vote for Wendy Gruel, an historic moment when the first woman the second woman on the West Coast will be elected. Don't listen to the DWP bulls crap that, uh, that Garcetti, that the problem in this city is the DWP. And let me tell you, if you are to the left of Kevin James and you vote for Garcetti, then you are a politically progressive democratic fascist. Now, you might want to sleep with Eric Garcetti. You might want to get down on your knees in front of Eric Garcetti, but that's a little different than voting for him. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the public. Historic day. Call right now. Call five friends. Garcetti uses sex. I use sex. Call five friends. We are going to win. We are going to take Garcetti down. We are going to put in Wendy Gruel, who was the only candidate that pointed out that the rapes have doubled in Hollywood. HollywoodHighlands.org. Viva Wendy. Okay. All right. All right. Delisa, please come for. Oh, yeah. Please come for, before you come, Mr. Reyes, for a quick announcement. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. I'd like to introduce students from Lincoln High School, the Lincoln High Tigers, uh, and. Wave everybody, folks. Let them know who you are. You can wave. The camera's on you. Wave, guys. You're and, and on Channel 35 live. Let your parents know that you were here. You weren't ditching school. <laughs> and we have proof. So welcome to City Hall. Okay, please come forward. I ask you to listen to me this time. Um, somebody spoke on a homeless situation. Um, I was out on the street and I'm selling my CD and I have the sheriffs and things bothering me. And I will see so many other nationalities, even when we're doing petitions and stuff, seems like it's been a problem when it comes down to African Americans being out doing anything to subside their income when the state looks at you and state there's no jobs and you go out and because you're aging people won't hire you in your um, job market. I'm asking y'all again to look at this homeless situation, selling and panhandling. I really don't know what it means and I would like to talk to someone or someone at this city council that can explain this to me. Because
because I feel like that uh, God said he like he was speaking was at my church was antsy Sunday. Miss Perry, I saw you there, but I will not be voting for him. I want somebody that's of God. God asking who will go. And I feel like the city council and the presidents are not doing what they should do to help these people that need help off the street that's selling. I would like with someone to talk to me to know why panhandling or selling when other nationalities are doing it, not being bought a bothered if I could get somebody to help with me with that and to go to Sacramento because I'm not going to stop. I'm going to be like you, Mr. W uh, President Wesson and um, uh, Parks and Perry, Garcetti, all of you guys. I think God wants me to march on now to make a better place for um, this world because our forefathers died and fought for us to have a better America. And I feel like now as I'm getting older, we're losing America. So let's march on because God's saying who will go. And you done been to my church, Mr. Weston, and I, I live in the 10th district. And I'm asking you to sit down as a president of city council and let's address this issue about giving citations and things. If I choose to give my money to homeless people that are standing on the freeway, I'm going to do it. I'm asking y'all to be a hard because Jesus said the poor is always going to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Next order of business. Council General has public comment is closed. Council has motions for posting and referral. They are posted and referred. That clears the desk. Okay. Announcements. <clears throat> Mr. Reyes. I just want to encourage everyone to go out and vote. We still have quite a few hours left. So get on out there. Thank you so much. Polls close this evening at 8 p.m. Please go vote. All right. Uh, let's rise. Uh, would everybody in the council chambers please rise for adjourning motions, adjourning motions. Mr. LaBange. I think uh, we should all take a moment to remember the people of Oklahoma with the tragedy of yesterday. Uh, in more Oklahoma and other parts of the Midwest, and our uh, Mr. Kokoyan, please uh, add that we have said. Well, I just wanted to mention that two of our firefighters are already there helping with the rescue effort, and uh, there may be uh, more coming that are at the ready. Right. Okay. Thank both. So remember you. Oklahoma, Mr. Parks. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask that we adjourn in memory of Doreen Lavon Nesbitt who was born in December uh, 1969, passed away April 20th of this year after a three-year battle with cancer. Uh, she was raised by her foster parents, Reverend and Mrs. Smallwood, who were the pastors of the Opportunity Missionary Baptist Church. In 2003, she was a, uh, became a member of the Southern Missionary Baptist Church. She worked diligently in Sunday school departments serving uh, nutrition, and teaching the, uh, teach, uh, teaching the children. She's also a member of the Deaconess and Nurse Aid Ministry. <clears throat> In July 2009, her son, uh, the love of her life, Dorian Levon, was entered into the world. Doreen uh, was a source of strength and comfort, uh, or, I'm sorry, Dorian was a source of strength and comfort to her at her time of need, and she fought a good fight. She loved and nourished him until the end. Doreen is survived by her son, Dorian, uh, her caretaker, Tiffany and Andre Mart Martin, host of family members, and Noreen at one time was a member of the 8th District staff. Okay, any other journeying motions? Okay, this meeting is adjourned.